It's Patrick Hutzel from intensivecarehotline.com, where we instantly improve the lives for families of critically ill patients in intensive care so that you can make informed decisions, have peace of mind, real power, real control, and so that you can influence decision-making fast, even if you're not a doctor or a nurse in intensive care. This is another episode of Your Questions Answered, and in last week's episode, I answered another question from one of my clients, and the question last week's episode was, is it best for my dad to go from ICU to step down, or should he be going to rehabilitation straight away? You can check out last week's episode by clicking on the link below this video. In this week's episode of Your Questions Answered, I want to continue answering the next questions regarding James and Christine's dad in ICU who's had a hemorrhagic stroke. James and Christine's dad had a brain decompression where they evacuated a large bleed from his brain after the hemorrhagic stroke. And their dad also underwent a craniectomy, which is a partial removal of the skull to decrease the brain pressures after the bleed. James and his sister Christine were getting their dad in one of the best hospitals in the United States, the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. In the meantime, their dad was getting a tracheostomy because he couldn't be weaned off the ventilator and the breathing tube. He also had a PEC tube for feeding inserted. He also had ongoing seizures due to the stroke and his anti-seizure medications needed to be optimized so he could wake up and progress to neurology rehabilitation. In today's one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy sessions with James and his sister Christine, we look at some setbacks their dad is still going through. Initially he had to be put back on the ventilator due to a pneumonia and he also ended up with the central line and arterial line again. In the meantime, he has come off the ventilator but still has the tracheostomy after over five weeks in ICU. This series of one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy is a real testimony for getting advice, run with it and get results. If you want to avoid LTAC and a nursing home for your loved one, you need to read or watch all of the consulting and advocacy sessions with James and Christine. So in today's episode, I want to again answer questions from James and Christine that are excerpts from multiple one-on-one -on -one phone, email and consul consulting and advocacy sessions with me. And the topic this week is, my dad is having a DVT and he's now on a heparin infusion. Will he need an IVC filter? You can also read or watch previous episodes of one-on-one -on -one consulting and advocacy sessions with James and Christine by clicking on the relevant links below this video. And if you are watching this on YouTube, just click on the link below this video. It'll get you to our website where you can access all the other episodes with James and Christine. So James writes, Hi Patrick, quick question. The doctor keeps using the risk of infection of staying in the hospital as the main reason to move him to LTAC. What is your response to this? Also, in the meantime, the doctors found a blood clot in my father's right calf which is his paralyzed leg. The doctors have ordered a CT scan this evening of his chest to check for clots in the lungs. If there are any clots in the lungs, they may put a filter in his stomach to make sure clots do not reach the lungs in preparation for his surgery next Friday. My father is currently also on a heparin infusion. The infectious disease doctor came in today and said my father doesn't have a UTI and there is nothing wrong, wrong with him now. They haven't done any more labs and have taken him off his antibiotics. His vitals are good nevertheless. Coincidentally, my father is an attorney and has few lawsuits where he has sued doctors because of clots in the legs, so he has been verbal about his concerns. He is now back in step down. Please advise of your thoughts on all of the above. Please let us know what, if anything, can be done about the clot in calf before or after the surgery. Thank you from James and Christine. So here is my response. Hi, James and Christine. Thank you for the update and thank you for renewing the consultations. I appreciate you as a client. With a clot in the leg and the shortness of breath on Tuesday night, your time, I am wondering if he had a mild PE, which stands for pulmonary embolus. 
I'm glad they are following up with a CT scan of the chest. How did they find out about the clot in his leg and when did they start using the heparin? Also, the clot in his leg could be a result from not enough mobility and lack of movement as we discussed previously. Has he had any TET stockings or compression stockings on his legs? Or has he got calf compressors on his legs to keep the blood flowing and circulating? It's good to hear that he has no infection and they have ruled it out. Inserting what is called an IVC filter, IVC stands for inferior vena cava filter, to stop the clot from moving upwards makes sense and seems common practice. Blood clots are usually managed conservatively, i.e. no surgery. Therefore, CT scan and potentially the IVC filter make sense. The heparin is definitely a bit of a risk for the upcoming surgery and they need to stop the heparin before surgery to minimize the risk of bleeding. With the heparin, do you know how much he's on and do you know if he requires oxygen via the trachea? Often during a PE, shortness of breath and oxygen levels dropping are symptoms that need to be managed. If your dad isn't short of breath and his oxygen levels are holding, hopefully he doesn't have a PE or pulmonary embolus. Also, as far as the transfer to LTAC is concerned, due to the higher infection risk in hospital, due to the higher infection risk in hospital, once again, I question their approach. Yes, I tend to agree that the infection risk in a hospital is higher compared to other facilities. Nonetheless, there is still an infection risk in LTAC as well. This is about continuity of care and it's about managing complications if they do come up. If this complication had come up with the DVT and the thrombus in LTAC, there would have been a very high chance that he would have to go back to ICU or a step down slash HDU anyway. LTAC is not equipped dealing with emergencies. On top of that, they are not incentivized to transfer patients back to ICU when emergencies or complications do occur because they miss out on revenue. Your dad is not out of the woods yet, as you can see. And once again, a transfer would only add on to already high stress levels. So James writes back, Hi Patrick, the IVC filter is going in tonight. The cranioplasty is tomorrow. My father is getting so much better with his cognition now. I need this go to right. I need this to go right and we need to be sure. It's 9.38 p.m. and my father is scheduled to have the IVC filter sometime this evening. Do you have any thoughts on the above before his surgery? Also, my father will be on the ventilator through tracheostomy for his surgery. Please let me know your thoughts on this. Also, would you happen to know the difference between a temporary IVC filter and a permanent IVC filter? Or do you have an opinion as to which one would be the better? Thank you from James and Christine. Hi, James. Because they have to stop the heparin for the surgery, they have to put in the IVC filter to prevent any clots from migrating towards the lungs. Most patients in ICU get a temporary IVC filter in with a removal down the line. In your dad's situation, he may get a, get a permanent one due to the ongoing immobility. I'm pretty sure I mentioned last week that your dad will need the tracheostomy for surgery because of ventilation. Hopefully after surgery, they can start working on removing the tracheostomy. Thank you. So James writes back. Thank you, Patrick. What are your thoughts on getting him off the ventilator after surgery? Do you think he will have to be weaned off again? What are your thoughts from James and Christine? Hi, James and Christine. Unless there are any unexpected complications, it should be smooth sailing. Ventilation is require, required due to anesthesia during surgery. Your dad should be able to come off the ventilator after surgery soon. James writes back. Hi, Patrick. They could not get the IVC filter in tonight because my father was squirmish on the table and they couldn't sedate him because they didn't stop his feet early enough. So now we are rescheduled for 7.30 in the morning. So he will be having the IVC filter at 7.30 a.m. and the cranioplasty surgery at 1.30 p.m. They're stopping the feeds 
tonight. Please let me know your thoughts on the above. I'm hoping all of the tests being done today and his surgeries tomorrow are not too stressful for him or on his body. Many thanks from James. Here's my response. Hi, James. Not stopping the feeds early enough is amateurish. Sorry, I hate to say it, but that's the reality. I think in a sense it's good that he has it all done in one day so he can go from one procedure to the next. I don't think too much is going to change if he has it all in one day. Let's wait and see. That's all you can do for now. James writes back. Hi, Patrick. I agree. So whose fault was that? The nurse? They decided to put in a filter in around 4 p.m. So they probably should have stopped the feeds around 4 to 5 p.m. in preparation for the filter at 11 p.m. Who's in charge of something like this? This is a major screw up in my eyes from James. So here is my response. Hi, James. This is definitely a major screw up. The nurses should be in charge of that. I also don't advocate for a procedure in the middle of the night if it can be avoided. The risk for complications after hours is just bigger. I hope that it all goes well. Now, if you're watching this and you want to get one on one consulting and advocacy, you can either select from the options on the top of the website or you can just go and book a free 15 minute consultation on the top of the website where it says schedule free appointment and then I can help you from there. So back to James. James writes back. Hi, Patrick. I've put a link in the email to the rehab center in Chicago, which apparently is the number one neuro, neuro rehab in the United States. Can you have a look and let me know what you think? I think he may be ready for this in two weeks or so after he builds more stamina. I will be in touch. I always appreciate your feedback and guidance. You have been a tremendous help. From James. Hi, James. I had a closer look at the website of the Chicago Neuro Rehab Center, where they talk about stroke recovery in particular. It certainly reads well, and it talks about all the things we've discussed over the phone, like speaking, walking, eating, toileting, showering, etc. I think it would be great if they could assess your dad somehow to see if he's suitable and what outcomes they think they could get for him and in what time frame. They certainly talk all the right language on their website. I might also be dependent on it might also be dependent on insurance as previously discussed. At the same time, there must be some alternatives closer to home who offer a similar stroke recovery or rehabilitation service. And I think it would be good to talk to them as well. I do believe the closer you have him to home, the better. Also, it might help also if you could talk to a former patient or a family who's been in a similar situation and who went through rehab at any of those places. Also, keep talking to your neurologist and neurosurgeon and see what they suggest as well. I do believe your dad is in a much better position now than he was a few weeks back to be assessed properly and take the next steps. His recovery to this point should be looked at very favorably by facilities, doctors, insurance and other specialists he's dealing with going forward. As I mentioned before, I'm now leaving familiar territory as the rehabilitation side of things is not really my specialty, but I know what needs to be done leading up to it. I hope that helps. Please let me know what else you need. So how can you become the best advocate for your critically ill loved one? How can you make informed decisions Get peace of mind, control, power and influence quickly whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. You will get to that all important feeling of making informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power and influence when you download your free instant impact report now by entering your email below. In your free instant impact report, you will learn quickly how to make informed decisions, get peace of mind, real power and real control, and how you can influence decision making fast whilst your loved one is critically ill in intensive care. 
Your free Instant Impact Report gives you in-depth insight that you must know whilst your loved one is critically ill or is even dying in intensive care. Sign up and download your free Instant Impact Report now by entering your email below. In your free Instant Impact Report, you will learn how to speak the secret intensive care language so that the doctors and the nurses know straight away that you are an insider and that you know and understand what's really happening in intensive care. In your free report, you will also discover how to ask the doctors and the nurses the right questions. Discover the many competing interests in intensive care and how your critically ill loved one's treatment may depend on those competing interests. How to eliminate fear, frustration, stress, struggle and vulnerability even if your loved one is dying. You will get five mind-blowing tips and strategies helping you to get on the right path to making informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power and influence in your situation. You will get real-world examples that you can easily adapt to your and your critically ill loved one situation. How to stop being intimidated by the intensive care team and how you will be seen as equals. You will get crucial behind the scenes insight so that you know and understand what is really happening in intensive care and how you need to manage doctors and nurses in intensive care and it's not what you think. Thank you for tuning into this week's Your Questions Answered episode and I'll see you again next week in another update. Make sure you also check out our blog section for more tips and strategies or simply send me an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com with your questions. Or you can call me. Find international phone numbers on the top of the website. Also, have a look at our ebook section where you get more ebooks, videos, and audio recordings, and where you can also get one on one consulting and advocacy with me via Skype, over the phone, and via email by clicking on the relevant tabs on the top of the website. This is Patrick Hutzel from intensivecarehotline.com. And I'll see you again next week in another update.